Hi, and thanks for joining the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. My name is Raphael Fazel. I am uh, the co-director of the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law. This is actually the, the third talk in uh, our Lent term program. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about how the Talking Animal series works before I'll introduce our speaker. Um, for those who are joining for the first time, the Talking Animal series uh, works as follows. We'll start with a presentation by our speaker that will last somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. We will end at 1.30 p.m. UK time. Um, after the presentation, there will be time uh, for Q&A and discussion. And everyone's warmly invited to join in in the discussion. Uh, maybe you're going to have questions or comments um, that you'd like to make. Uh, please feel free to come in directly using the raise hand function. Uh, that way I can go through the different raised hands and, and give you the chance to ask your question directly. I think that's usually the nicest way uh, for people to, to contribute to the discussion. But maybe if you're in a train somewhere or can turn on your, your camera or mic, you can also just pop your question or comment in the chat. That's perfectly fine too. Um, I'll have all the mics uh, on mute until we reach the discussion. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website. So if you'd like to share it later on with a friend, um, uh, it should be up on our website in the coming days. And it'll also be on, on YouTube on our channel there. Good. That's all as far as the more sort of formal aspects of, of how the series works. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, and that's Professor uh, Deborah Tsao. Uh, Deborah Tsao is a professor in the School of Humanities, Languages and Social Science at Griffith University in Australia. And in fact, she's staying up late so she could start, uh, join us today. So we're really grateful to her for that. Uh, Deborah Tsao is an animal law scholar and advocate who specializes in animal law and ethics. And she also writes about Chinese legal language and culture. Professor Tsao holds a Bachelor of Arts from the Shanghai Foreign Language Institute, an LLB and MPhil from the University of Queensland and a PhD from Griffith University. Uh, she publishes in both English and Chinese and writes on Chinese cultural and philosophical conceptions about animals and the plight of animals in China for Western audiences. But she also introduces Western animal law concepts to a Chinese audience. So she really speaks to both audiences. Uh, her major books include Animals Are Not Things, which was published in Chinese in 2007. Uh, the book While the Dog Gently Weeps, also in Chinese, uh, published in uh, 2012. Have you ever thought about the pig's feelings, farm animal welfare law and regulation in China and beyond, published um, two years ago. And then most recently, the third edition of her popular uh, Animal Law in Australia. And, and today she will be talking to us about animal law and regulation in China. Uh, Professor Cao, thanks so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much, Rafael. I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, the Cambridge Animal Rights Law Center. It is a huge honor. Now I'm going to discuss animal law related issues in China. And I would also like to hear your views in comparison with the situation in England and other jurisdictions. As we know, uh, throughout China's long history, animals have always been very important to Chinese lives and integral to Chinese culture. By the way, the Chinese New Year is coming up in a couple of days, uh, the Year of the Dragon, which is a very important and iconic imaginary animal symbol in Chinese culture. I wrote before the uh, the Chinese love animals. They love them to death, literally. Uh, they love to eat them, to kill them, to take them in medicine, to wear them, to watch them in entertainment, to make a, a art form in ivory and other carvings. In the process, they drive some animal species to extinction or to its brink. They also cause the living ones extreme pain and suffering before eating them. Unfortunately, this is part of China and the Chinese culture. 
otherwise a great human civilization, a country with the longest continuous history on earth. So animals of all kinds, rare and common, are resources to be exploited, tools to be used, or food to be eaten. So exploitation in China is not new, but has a long history. There is a general in, uh, instrumentalist approach to animals in China. This is the case against the backdrop of the traditional Chinese philosophic teachings that are largely sympathetic towards animals, a major paradox in Chinese culture. Animal sentience or ideas uh, resembling it are not alien to Chinese and have always been widely accepted in Chinese culture. Ancient Chinese imperial laws had provisions on some farm and working animals, imposing duties on those in charge of the animals, uh, started from the Tang Dynasty about uh, 1500 years ago. But animal sentience, animal welfare, or uh, cruelty to animals uh, are not reflected in contemporary Chinese law. Uh, animal cruelty in China takes many forms. For instance, by individuals, by companies, by the state, uh, in the forms of brutal treatment, torture, mutilation, and generally inflicting pains and sufferings and brutal killing and mass slaughter. More specifically, I would like to highlight a few areas of crimes against animals in, in China. Uh, specifically, uh, wildlife crimes and wildlife eating in particular. As you may know, since early 2020, a comprehensive national ban has been imposed on the trade of protected wildlife for eating purposes and for the eating of such animals. Uh, now, uh, such laws have been incorporated into the Wide Wildlife Protection Law of China. We won't go into the uh, details of these legal provisions, but as you can see there, instead, we'll look at a few court cases decided by Chinese courts in recent years in this area. Uh, the, uh, the first one is the Skylark hunting and selling case. In this case, 14 defendants were charged and convicted for activities associated with killing wild birds uh, in 2017 decided of a court in Jiangsu province in China, which by the way is the, one of the most prosperous and uh, most developed coastal regions in China next to Shanghai. The basic facts of the case are that the main defendant uh, supplied uh, the lethal pesticide carbon foreign to kill wild birds with large a number of birds involved. And uh, the, uh, the birds caught or killed this way were then sold for eating purposes, including to restaurants. As you can see there, large number of birds were involved, tens of thousands of them. And uh, there are some more figures here, as you can see, and uh, seizures by the police of various materials also, uh, 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 birds and, and other uh, relevant materials, things like uh, restaurant game meat menus and bird catching equipment and the poisons. Many of the seized birds uh, were identified as state protected animals. And the, the, the prosecution also obtained uh, expert uh, 
advice and opinions regarding the poison used. But basically, they concluded that eating uh, the birds killed this way uh, can cause serious harm to human health. So they are not only endangered and killing birds, but also endangered human life. And you can see there, not only skylark, but also other types of animals and wildlife that have been caught and killed and, and sold and eaten. And this is from the uh, testimony from the, the wife of the main defendant describing what it did. I was intrigued by the, what kind of tools they use to catch so many birds. Uh, they are called bird callers. So I Googled and this is what I found. There are many uh, such bird catching or uh, other small animal catching tools and equipment for sale on many of the Chinese online platforms. Uh, so this is just one of them, both legal and illegal ones, readily available on the internet in China. So the court convicted all 14 of them and sentencing them to various terms of imprisonment Uh, the uh, the crime they, they were convicted of uh, was the crime for producing and selling toxic and harmful food, which is a general crime, not specifically for animal or animal products. And as you can see, the sentences are not very severe. So I would like to show you another case where tough, much tougher, much more severe sentencing. Uh, were given. The golden uh, pheasant killing and eating case. Jin Ji in Chinese for golden pheasant. They are some of the most spectacularly beautiful birds indigenous to China. Uh, and I found this painting done by one of the emperors. Uh, from the Song Dynasty in China about uh, a thousand years ago. As you can see there, the, the, the bird, which is Jin Ji, and also importantly, the characters he wrote on that painting, uh, the two characters uh, there, uh, you can see Wu De, Five Virtues, this is what Chinese, ancient Chinese, many ancient Chinese writers, and not just the emperor, uh, saw in animals the virtue, the, the moral behavior in animals. The, the five virtues are uh, the first one, the colorful uh, feathers on the golden pheasants representing culture. Virtue number two, the male pheasant has a violent appearance representing courage. Number three, male pheasants fight heroically representing bravery. Uh, number four, virtue, female pheasants protect their young representing kindness and love. There is an alternative uh, interpretation for virtue number four, um, the uh, uh, golden pheasants, when they find food, they will call out to other golden pheasants to share the food, representing kindness and benevolence. Virtue number five is the uh, male gold, golden pheasants are very punctual when they crow at dawn, representing trustworthiness. I said earlier, uh, ideas similar to uh, 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 
uh, similar to, to uh, animal sentient are not alien to the Chinese for thousands of years. But more than that, Chinese, ancient Chinese also believe that animals possess moral characters. There is no distinction between animals and humans in terms of morality, which is uh, has only been recognized or discussed in Western philosophy, philosophy in, in very recent times, as we should always believe that morality is exclusive to humans. Of course, ancient Chinese did not know that there is a biological basis explanation for the moral behavior of animals, as we now learned from the works of Professor uh, Donald Broom uh, in recent times about the biological basis for morality for both humans and animals. But back to the case, this is from 2018. Uh, Oh, no, sorry, for 2020, but around between 2017 and 2019, uh, uh, three defendants uh, were caught and convicted for hunting and killing golden pheasants and other animals. In this case, the three defendants caught 10 white golden pheasants and ate at them. And this is how uh, one of the uh, defendants described what they did. Basically, they went to the mountains um, and, um, and, uh, and killed the birds and took them home and cleaned them and cooked them and eat them. So they were convicted and sentenced to uh, between ten, uh, seven to five years in prison. Uh, for, th for these uh, bird cases, they are actually not particularly significant in terms of Chinese criminal legal system or animal crimes in China, unfortunately. There are actually many such cases and many involving large number of birds. For example, the one set case uh, uh, from 2021, about 360,000 birds, wild birds were involved in that one case. Another case from 2018, a criminal group was caught for illegally hunting and selling wild birds. Uh, with around 510,000 wild birds were involved in a 40-day hunting period. I'm showing you uh, these bird cases because generally speaking, bird killing is not as high profile as other cases, for instance, involving elephants or, or rhinos. But they can just be as devastating for these birds and for their species and for nature as a whole. But most people are not paying much attention to them. But occasionally they are reported, for instance, in 2017, it was reported in China that He Hua Qu, the Chinese name for the uh, yellow breasted bunting was in recent years upgraded to the status of critically, injured, in, uh, critically endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature due to the heavy hunting in China as the birds fly over from Europe to China during winter migration. As a newspaper in the UK at the time described it, one of Britain's most beautiful birds might become extinct after becoming a popular Chinese snack. But by the way, the disappearance or killing of birds in the UK are not all Chinese doing, of course not. I uh, recommend you to watch Sir David Edinburgh's documentary, Wonder of Songs, 
a most beautiful and educational documentary, also a very sad one. He said that London now has very few nightingales left. He said, if Keith, John Keys, is alive today and wants to hear the beautiful nightingale sing in London, he probably would not find them. He said in the past 50 years, about 90% of nightingales in England have disappeared. And in the last few decades, some tens of millions of birds have disappeared in England. So it is a common problem caused by humans, not just Chinese, but human society across the planet. And not just birds, but all other animals as well. Because humans take their land, their forest, destroy their homes and habitat. And for our blue planet, where humans cannot take or occupy the oceans, we pollute them. Now back to China. Uh, there are uh, various laws and regulations today relating to animals. For instance, uh, wild, uh, wildlife protection laws, uh, regulations for companion animals, for the management and ownership of dogs, for instance animals used in research and uh, for farm animals to a lesser extent and other working animals. One common feature of all these laws is that they are mainly for human protection and for the regulation of the use of animals. Animals are secondary in most of these laws. But in recent years, there have been laws and efforts in China to improve animal welfare. For instance, the, uh, the uh, standards for the humane slaughter of pigs, uh, which by the way, with input and assistance from international animal NGOs. Some Western animal welfare scientists have also been contributing in this area in China. For, for example, the works by Professor Donald Broom of uh, Cambridge Uni University here. Um, now, um, I would like to say a few words uh, about uh, about Chinese culture and uh, wildlife eating. Uh, today in China, the Chinese do not eat wildlife because of starvation or a shortage of food. I've studied many hundreds of court cases. None of the defendants ever said they kill or eat those animals because they were starving to death or they had to feed their families. Actually, in Chinese restaurants, wild animal meat dishes cost a lot more. Similarly, when Chinese, uh, for some Chinese who eat cats and dogs, oh, by the way, most Chinese actually do not eat cats, only in a very small area in Guangdong province in southern China, people uh, eat cats. Vast majority of Chinese people do not eat cats, but these days more Chinese are eating dogs because of their availability. But even for that, the Chinese do not eat dogs today because of starvation or shortage of food, not in today's China. So here are some uh, links of uh, media reports about wildlife consumption and wildlife eating in China uh, when they interviewed me and others uh, in the last few years, if you're interested. So we have uh, some major challenges in China for animals. One issue is that uh, there is no law protecting animals against cruelty. And uh, one of the major countries in the world does not have such laws. 
I was often asked by others, especially by reporters in international media when they interview me about animals in China, what is the main barrier for passing anti-cruelty law? I told them, I'm, I'm telling you now today, uh, the biggest barrier is the Chinese government. There is a lack of will on the part of the Chinese government. If they want to make such a law, they can do it tomorrow because China is not a democratic country without the, um, uh, and the, the, the government and the legislature can make laws much faster if they want to than, for instance, many Western countries, uh, as the, the uh, so the, the, uh, uh, go, the, without the long, sometimes never ending legislative process when making laws for animals in some Western countries, but for, in China, for instance, uh, they outlaw the entire ivory industry a few years ago, and also the ban of wildlife eating. They did it almost immediately, uh, shortly after the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, in February and March 2020. So in today's China, many people, in particular educated and young people, are very much in support of making anti-cruelty laws, including many Chinese uh, uh, NPC, the National People's Congress, delegates to the Chinese parliament. So it is an indication of social progress regarding the treatment of animals in China today, very different from 20 or 30 years ago. There is a popular sentiment among many Chinese that there is a need for legislation against cruelty to animals. So it is important to encourage the Chinese government to pass, pass such laws. It is also worth noting that China actually has some of the toughest criminal laws and the penalties regarding animal uh, animal related crimes, as it, uh, in contrast to many countries, for instance, Australia uh, and Western countries in general, where there is a lack of prosecution of crimes against animals. I know this as a fact because whilst I did extensive research when I wrote the book Animal Laws in Australia about 10 years ago, there are very, very few criminal cases. Uh, last year, when I uh, did more research for the third edition of the book, there are more cases, but still, generally speaking, there is a lack of prosecution and uh, there, the question of uh, lenient sentencing. We also know that law is a double-edged sword which has been used to protect animals as well as legalize cruelty to, to, uh, to uh, animals in most countries, in all countries, I guess, in, uh, including Western countries, for instance, intensive animal farming and hunting and the so-called trophy hunting and believe it's still, still legal in many countries. And uh, uh, the, the recent example is the uh, live animal export in Australia. Uh, in last week, weeks, and now actually it's happening now, the uh, Australia still allows live animal export to the Middle East, for instance, uh, subject the animals to totally unnecessary and extreme pains and suffering not only on the long sea voyage from Australia to the Middle East, but also to the barbaric treatment at the destination countries in the Middle East. But all of this is legal and protected by law. Now, back to China. So some of the major issues related to animal in China no anti cruelty law and wildlife consumption, both legal and illegal, and intensive farming, and the environmental and human health and animal health concerns, and others. So, uh, what uh, can we do 
uh, about these matters. Uh, I would like to mention two major areas, education and law. Apart from law, uh, more importantly, I believe, educating the general population in China is crucial. In schools and universities, in society in general, for instance, on social media and other educational efforts. As the English animal rights advocate Harry Salt said in 1892, education must always remain the antecedent and indispensable condition of humanitarian progress and of the animal rights and animal law project. He said it is society as a whole that needs enlightenment and remonstrance for the recognition of animal rights. And I think his teaching is, very use, is a very useful guide for the animal protection efforts in China. An important foundation, an important pathway, I believe. And let me elaborate a little bit. The love for birds and also the catching and killing of birds in China has been with the Chinese for centuries. By the way, actually, birds were the original uh, companion animal for the Chinese with uh, thousands of years history. Uh, so for the catching and killing of birds, Chinese teenagers, especially in rural China, had a pastime of uh, bird catching that the many Chinese boys and young men have done for centuries. It's called Tao Niao Wo, uh, digging uh, bird nests to catch the young birds or get the bird eggs. Many Chinese well-known writers wrote about their childhood memories. They're often refer to, referring to such activities. And in their writings, they, uh, they, they remember uh, what they did when growing up, but without any concern for the baby birds or the mother birds. Then about 10 years ago, many Chinese had a huge shock when two young Chinese men were sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for doing just that. In 2015, the case was widely reported in China and trending on Chinese social, uh, social media and official media. In that case, from Henan province in central China, a, Ch a university student was convicted of illegal, illegal hunting of rare and endangered wildlife and jailed for 10 years and six months. And the other offender was jailed for 10 years for purchasing the birds. 16 young birds were illegally hunted. Uh, they were uh, Eurasian hobbies, a small slim falcon, a special protected animal. So that's why the very heavy penalty. But back then when uh, many of the commentaries uh, were about whether the court decision was justified. And many were defending the, the young offenders. But at the same time, for many other Chinese, the, the decision was a huge, real shock. Make many people think about the traditional activity as part of growing up. It serves as a warning to many Chinese and as a deterrent. It does more than just punishing the two young offenders, but a lesson for the whole society, serving an important educational purpose for the general public. And this is what I say in the title of my talk today, Saving Animals and Saving People. Saving people morally and making them better human beings to enlighten the Chinese population and drag them to the modern and civilized ways of thinking and living as responsible inhabitants of the planet. Another thing is in recent years on Chinese social media, very often the trending videos are about animals, some about extreme cruelty, but also many more about ordinary animals, cats and dogs and other animals living everyday life with their family members and in nature. With animals educating the Chinese, ordinary Chinese, showing them what they are like, and they have feelings, and they have intelligence very much like us. So we should not underestimate these, you know, many of those cute cats and dog videos, because 
they are educating the Chinese at homes and also online. I believe these might have some long lasting educational impact on how the Chinese people view animals and how to treat them. That is animals educating people, reducing human ignorance. It's a different kind of education, animal educating people and saving people morally and from jail, actually. And officially, there have also been some encouraging uh, developments. Uh, the Ministry of Education in the last two years now requires that uh, for the teaching of practical uh, experience courses for grade five to seven and seven to nine, one component is to do practical work experience and service in charitable and volunteer work. And of these, for the first time, animal rescue shelters are listed as part of the experience that students should have. Uh, another thing I would like to mention is that uh, the seriousness of Chinese animal situation is not isolated. It will not have been the spread actually without the collaboration or collusion with the animal industries, both legal and illegal in other countries and internationally, uh, in globalized animal cruelty. For instance, intensive farming, which was introduced to China uh, from the West in the last few decades, and uh, wildlife crime and, uh, and uh, trafficking and uh, the international crime syndicates in wildlife trafficking, in particular in Southeast Asia, for instance, and uh, animal use in labor laboratory in research. China now is the largest producer of non-human primates used for research, but not just for China. China also exports them to other countries uh, for research purposes. So humans are the leading cause of pains and suffering and destruction, and extinction of other living beings on the planet across national boundaries. So it's not just Chinese. Uh, this is what I called crimes against animality, which requires global solution. Uh, in recent times, I've been working with a small group of mostly European animal lawyers and uh, scholars our long-term goal is to achieve the recognition for the crime against animality international law. If you're interested, you can have a look at the website. Now, finally, I want to end this discussion in a more positive uh, note. There is some optimism regarding animals in China. In the last 10 years or so, enormous progress has been made in animal protection efforts in China especially in terms of people's awareness and attitude and concern for about uh, uh, cruelty to animals. More ordinary Chinese, especially young people, now recognize that cruelty to animal is morally wrong and they are taking actions to help animals in need. There is a grassroots animal protection movement in China. Anyway, that's what I call it. <laughs> Uh, and I'm also very happy to say that I have been a contributor to all of this, not just documenting these changes, but also making input, especially in terms of uh, raising people's awareness and changing people's attitude and uh, uh, the thinking about animals and working with many ordinary Chinese, helping and rescuing animals and rehoming them in China. So the animal situation in China is important as China is a huge country with a huge human population and even bigger animal population living and dying often painfully there. So it should be a concern, not just to people like me or Chinese animal advocates, but to all animal advocates and people who care about animals anywhere and everywhere. So thank you.